Bill's a, a, a friend of mine. I love him. Uh, we have a spirit that when we hadn't seen each other in a long time, but we connect immediately. He's a brother to me. Uh, I just spent time with him last night trying to let him know how much he matters, how much he has value. And uh, my goal for us today at Fellowship Church for him, because he travels around the country so much, he's with senators, he's with all kinds of people all across the nation. I wanted this little place in Inglewood to be a place where he could be loved today and get, get his spirit just refreshed today. And you could leave here going, wow, I'm going to go out and I'm going to get him now. Amen. <laughs> Let's welcome Bill Federer today. Come on. Well, it is a tremendous honor for me to be with you, Fellowship Church family, and I want you to know how much I respect and admire your pastor, Gary Clark. He is a great friend and a great man of God, and let's thank the Lord for Pastor Gary Clark. And I do get a chance to speak around the country, and uh, I was at an event uh, recently with um, uh, Mike Huckabee and Rafael Cruz and uh, Bobby Jindal and uh, I get to chant and, and Ted Cruz and the um, uh, the country has many leaders that the Lord is raising up. We are facing crises, but you know one of the things I found is that God always seems to wait till things look hopeless, and then He raises up little nobodies who are small in their own eyes but big in faith and courage to do great things. And so I'm going to tell you some stories about the past and how our country faced some major crises and we had leaders with faith and courage that rose up. And uh, my wife has heard me speak for 30 years and she decided to pick out the best stories. And so we put together a book and these are ones where there's a crisis, they pray, things turn around. Pretty simple. And uh, now we uh, recently had... Um, the uh, First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas, uh, the pastor, Robert Jeffries, ordered 4,000 copies of this book to give to all of his supporters. So we're currently out of stock, and we just are getting them reprinted, so I don't have any here. So what kind of author can speak about a book? He doesn't have any on the table. But if you take a little flyer and fill it out, we'll send you the book f f uh, with, uh, with no shipping cost in, in two weeks. You can get it. But anyway, so here's the story. Now, everybody's heard the saying, America's the greatest country in the world. I decided to prove it. So I spent about a year researching every civilization that has ever existed on planet Earth. Wow. And I found some interesting things. The first human records appear about three or 4,000 BC. Sumerian cuneiform on clay tablets, right? In the Mesopotamian Valley, today that's Iraq. And Egyptian hieroglyphics on papyrus and stone. And so if you think of it, three or 4,000 BC, when writing was invented, and we're around 2080, so Two and four, that's about 6,000 years of recorded human history. And sort of coincidentally, that's about as long as the Bible says man's been around. Gee, what do you know? And, um, and so I have um, thought of it, 6,000 years is not that long. It's only 60 people living 100 years each back to back. Everyone's met someone who's lived 100 years, maybe a grandmother, right? We're talking 60 grandmothers, and you're all the way back to the beginning of recorded human history. It's not that long. But I found it's also been a 6,000-year quest to rule the world. And so, uh, Daniel Webster said, miracles do not cluster, and what has happened once in 6,000 years may not happen again. Hold on to the Constitution, for if the American Constitution should fail, there will be anarchy throughout the world. He thought something special happened right here. Here's James Wilson. He signed the Declaration and the Constitution, was put on the Supreme Court by George Washington. He said, after a period of 6,000 years since creation, the United States exhibit to the world the first instance of a nation assembling voluntarily and deciding that system of government under which they and their posterity should live. And then Teddy Roosevelt said, in no other place and at no other time has the experiment of government of the people, by the people, for the people, been tried on so vast a scale as here in our own country. So they thought something special happened right here. Well, during this 6,000 years, empires have risen, empires have fallen, but one thing keeps repeating itself, power concentrates into the hands of one person. Now we call this one person by different names. Caesar, Caliph, Chairman, Chieftain, Grand Khan, Kaiser, Maharaja, you know, Satrap, Sheik, Sultan. The name changes, but the function remains the same. Power gravitates into the hands of one person. And uh, I believe, it's sort of like the Lord of the Rings, remember that? Always remember Frodo, the ring is trying to get back to its master. It wants to be found. Power wants to concentrate. And so I think it goes back to the fall in the garden. 
and selfishness coming into the human DNA and Cain killing Abel and one king taking a kingdom from another king. And so you put some babies in a playpen, one of them will take the rattle from the others. You put some kids on a playground, one of them is the bully hogging the ball. Put some people in the woods, one of them is the Indian chief and put them in an inner city, one of them is the gang leader. And all a king is, in a sense, is a glorified gang leader, right? You know, I mean, you reward those that do what you say and you punish those that don't. And so it's the patronage system. If you get to be friends with the king, you are more equal. If you are, are not friends with the king, you are less equal. And if you're an enemy of the king, you're dead. It's called treason. <laughs> so for most of world history, equality was how close of an orbit can you get to the king? Uh, here is Calvin Coolidge. The history of government on this earth has been almost entirely rule of force held in the hands of a few. Under our Constitution, America committed itself to power in the hands of the people. So I wrote a whole book on it. Don't have time to go through it. But through the 6,000 years, we've had uh, Tilgath Palaser of Assyria and Sennacherib and uh, Cyrus of Persia and Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar and Genghis Khan and Attila the Hun and Montezuma and Justinian and uh, Henry VIII. And, uh, but the most powerful empire that planet Earth had ever seen was the British king, King George III. The sun never set on the British Empire. It controlled 13 million square miles, a half a billion people. All of India, a quarter of the world's population right there, was controlled by Britain. Hong Kong, New Zealand, Australia, countries in uh, you know, Africa from Egypt and Kenya down to South Africa, British Guyana, Barbados, Jamaica, Canada, and the American colonies. And we decide we're going to break away from this most powerful king that the planet had ever seen, and we have no army and no navy? <laughs> this is going to take a miracle. Anyway, so we have... George Washington in New York City. It is 1776. The British send the largest invasion force in world history up to this date, 400 ships, 32,000 troops. It looked like a forest of trees filling up the New York Harbor. And in the Continental Congress, General William Livingston proposed a day of fasting and prayer. It passes without dissent. It says, we earnestly recommend the 17th of May to be observed as a day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer that we may with united hearts confess and bewail our manifold sins and transgressions and by a sincere repentance and amendment of life appease God's righteous displeasure and through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ obtain his pardon and forgiveness. And so George Washington gets the order, and he says, the Continental Congress having ordered Friday the 17th of May, instant, to be observed as a day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer, humbly to supplicate the mercy of Almighty God, that it would please him to pardon all our manifold sins and transgressions. The general commands all officers and soldiers to pay strict obedience to the orders of the Continental Congress, that by their unfeigned and pious observation of their religious duties, they may incline the Lord and give her a victory to prosper our arms. Well, Washington writes to his brother, we expect a very bloody summer of it at New York. We are not either in men or arms prepared for it. If our cause is just as I most religiously believe it to be, the same providence which has in many instances appeared for us will still go on to afford us its aid. And so they rush a copy of the Declaration out to George Washington. In New York, he has it read to his troops July 9th. Do you know the Declaration mentions God four times? Laws of nature and of nature's God. All men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights and the supreme judge of the world, and pr protection of divine providence. But this line right here is the most revolutionary political statement in world history. Because for most of world history, it was the king that gave the rights. It was this divine right of kings idea, that God gives all of his rights and authority to the king, and he dispenses it to the people. Right? What we did in America is we bypassed the king. And we said the creator gives the rights directly to the people, and then we choose our leaders from amongst ourselves. This is the experiment. So when you pledge allegiance to the flag, you're pledging allegiance to you having your destiny in your hands directly under God. Instead of saying, well, there's a king that has to be the one dispensing God's destiny to me. Anyway, so it's a sliding scale of virtue. Uh, power wants to concentrate into the hands of a king. Absolute power corrupts, absolutely. America decided we want to have power separated, but it's chaos unless the people have virtue. And so our form of government like Israel, is dependent on the priests and the pastors teaching the word of God. And if people have virtue, they have freedom. But if they give up their virtue, there's crisis and the power concentrates. I tell people, have you ever had a little doggy? As long as the doggy has self-control, he has lots of freedom to run around the house and jump on the couch in the bed. 
If the little doggy does not have self-control, he loses his freedom and he's locked in a cage or the backyard. <laughs> and so it's the same as a nation. If we have internal morals and self-control, we get lots of freedom. But if we give up the morals and give in to our passions and lust and commit crimes and everything, we're going to end up losing our freedom and it's going to grow back to a dictator. Anyway, uh, I, in America, we sort of have a hybrid where we get something from Israel, the idea of rights from a creator, Athens, the idea of a democracy, voting, Rome, the idea of representatives with the republic, and then the England constitution. But um, back to our story. So a loyalist is somebody that is living in America, but they're loyal to the king of England. I know it's hard for us to imagine you could have someone living in America that's not loyal to America, but that was the case. And this loyalist led 10,000 British troops to march through Jamaica Pass at nighttime in New York, and they attacked Washington from behind on August 27, 1776. So this is called the Battle of Long Island or the Battle of Brooklyn Heights. It's the largest battle of the entire Revolutionary War. It's the entire U.S. Army. We don't have any spare army anywhere. This is the whole thing. And 3,000 Americans die, only 300 British. And so as the... Uh, British are butchering our men. The brave Maryland regiment, these 400 soldiers, they charge six times directly into the British ranks, and just about all these guys get killed, but they buy time for the rest of the army to turn around. Washington's watching these guys fight. He says, good God, what brave fellows I have lost this day. Well, they fight all day long, and by the evening time, Washington is pinned up against the water. And the next day, he'll probably be hung, and America will probably be another British colony like Kenya or India. But Washington decides to get every boat he can find and ferry his men and arms and troops and cannons across the East River to Manhattan Island all night long. And the water is calm where the Americans are and boisterous where the British are. But then the sun begins to come up. And now he's really in trouble because half his men are still on duty and there are not enough left to fight. And so his chief of intelligence, Major Ben Talmadge, says, as the dawn of the next day approached, those of us who remained in the trenches became very anxious for our own safety. And when the dawn appeared, there were several regiments still on duty. At this time, a very dense fog began to rise off the river, and it seemed to settle in a peculiar manner over both encampments. I recollect this peculiar providential occurrence perfectly well, and so very dense was the atmosphere that I could scarcely discern a man at six yards distance. We tarried until the sun had risen, but the fog remained as dense as ever. While well, Washington was on the last boat that left, the fog lifts, the British charge, no one's there. This was the last chance the British had to capture the entire American army all at once. Washington later writes, the hand of providence has been so conspicuous in all this the course of the war that he must be worse than an infidel that lacks faith, but it will be time enough for me to turn preacher when my present appointment ceases. Well, then Washington is chased out of New York, across New Jersey, into Pennsylvania. His troops dwindle from 20,000 to 2,000. Uh, the Continental Congress decides to flee Philadelphia. They send him a note that says, uh, until further notice, you're in charge of America. And they, it's, it's sort of like, you know, don't forget to turn the lights out. This is the note. It says, until Congress shall otherwise order, General Washington shall be possessed of full power to order and direct all things. Bye. <laughs> anyway, Washington has Thomas Paine's uh, American Crisis read to his troops. This is December 1776. He says, these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered, yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. Heaven knows how to put a proper price on its goods, and it would be strange, indeed, if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. Well, Washington, uh, at Christmas Day evening, 1776, he crosses the Delaware, attacks the German Hessian troops at Trenton, captures a thousand of them, and then he comes back again and he's at Princeton. And the British are waiting till the next day to attack him. And that night, Washington leaves a couple men in his camp to bang pots and pans. He marches his whole army to the other side of Princeton. And then the British attack the next morning into an empty camp. And Washington attacks the British from behind. Good. And it's going great until the British turn and start fighting and some of the Americans decide to run away. Washington is not about to give up this victory. He rides his horse to where the men are running away and he yells at them to follow him. He rides within 30 yards of the British, turns and faces his men and says, fire. They fire past Washington at the British. The British return the volley. He's in the middle of the field getting shot at from both sides. 
and when the smoke of their muskets clear, they see Washington on his horse waving his coat saying, Charge! <laughs> they charge and capture 800 more of the British. This was the Battle of Princeton. Ezra Stiles was the president of Yale. He writes, in our lowest and most dangerous state, 1776-1777, we sustained ourselves against the British Army of 60,000 troops commanded and led by the ablest generals Britain could procure throughout Europe with a naval force of 22,000 seamen in above 80 men of war. Who but a Washington, inspired by heaven, could have conceived the surprise move upon the enemy at Princeton or that Christmas Eve when Washington and his army crossed the Delaware? The United States are under peculiar obligations to become a holy people unto the Lord our God. Amen. Well, after that victory is the Battle of Saratoga. The British General Johnny Burgoyne was, pay, was giving money and arms to the Indians to commit terrorist attacks against the American settlements. This was sort of like a fast and furious. Remember Eric Holder giving guns to the drug gangs in Mexico? Anyway, so this was the, uh, this was the British General Johnny Burgoyne giving guns to the Indians to attack the Americans. And uh, one night, the, um, there was this guy named David Jones. And David Jones uh, had a fiancé, Jane McRae. David was a loyalist. He kisses his fiancée, Jane McRae, goodbye. He goes and enjoys General Johnny Burgoyne. They're coming back through New York, and he's all anxious because they're getting close to his village, and he's going to see his fiancée again. But that night, the Indians come into the camp with all their scalps, and he notices this long, beautiful hair. It was his fiancée's. Yes, the Indians killed her, scalped her, and this caused an uproar in the British camp. How could you do this? So General Burgoyne has to meet with the Indians and tell them to tone it down. Well, the Indians only knew on and off. They were either at peace or at war. They didn't know any of this limited warfare stuff, so the Indians leave. And now Burgoyne, with his 6,000-man British army, is in the middle of the New York forest, and he doesn't know where he's at, where the, where the Americans are. He doesn't know anything. And all of a sudden, the Americans attack, and we are able to force the British to surrender. The Battle of Saratoga. This is an amazing victory. 6,000 are captured. The painting of the Battle of Saratoga is in the U.S. Capitol's stat, uh, rotunda. If you visit the U.S. Capitol, you will see this painting. And so Washington writes to his brother, I most devoutly congratulate my country and every well-wisher to the cause on this signal stroke of providence. The Continental Congress declares the first national day of Thanksgiving after the Declaration of Independence had been written. It says, with one heart and one voice, join the penitent confession of their manifold sins, that it may please God through the merits of Jesus Christ, mercifully to forgive and blot them out, and under the providence of Almighty God, secure for the United States the greatest of all human blessings, independence and peace. Well, then there's Valley Forge. They had hundreds of our men die. The next spring, Washington says, the commander-in-chief directs that divine service be performed every Sunday to the distinguished character of patriot. It should be our highest glory to laud the more distinguished character of Christian. And then there's two types of pastors in America. Calvinist view is God has a plan for your salvation, a plan for your life, for your family, and your government. And it's your job to put God's plan in place. There was the pietist view that came from uh, the German pastors, when Luther had his just sealed by faith uh, and began the Reformation, it was a personal experience to Martin Luther. But some princes that wanted to break away from Rome said, I'm going to make my whole kingdom Lutheran. And so for the people in their kingdom, it was not necessarily a personal experience. It was the prince deciding for them. Now, they did have more emphasis on the Bible, but there was a rev revival movement that began to spread through the church called pietism, that says, look, you have to have a personal relationship with Jesus. It's not just having some doctrines in your brain. And so these were the two different types of pastors in America. There was a pietist Lutheran pastor, Henry Mullenberg, and he said, oh, um, don't get involved in government. Because the pietist said, if you have a personal experience with Jesus, you should not do the things you used to do. You know, drink and party and go to these lewd theaters and get involved in worldly things like government. So you had the pietist pastor saying, don't get involved. Now, the ultimate of this is the Amish, right, where they said, don't get involved at all. And so these were the two competing things. And uh, a, a pietist pastor, Henry Mullenberg, had a son, John Peter Pat Mullenberg. He was a pastor in Virginia. He heard Patrick Henry's speech. He goes to Washington, and Washington makes him a colonel and says, raise your troops. He goes to his church, gives a sermon on Ecclesiastes, a time for all things, a time to preach and a time to fight takes off his clerical robe, and he has the uniform of a continental soldier. He ends up becoming a general and a congressman and a senator, and the state of Pennsylvania put his statue in the U.S. Capitol. 
And there he is taking off his clerical robe and having a uniform on. Well, he has a brother, Frederick Mullenberg. And Frederick Mullenberg was a Lutheran pastor in New York. And he said, don't get involved. You're, not, you're, not, you're doing stuff that men of the cloth should not be involved with. And then the British burned Frederick Mullenberg's church. He gets involved. And then he ends up becoming a U.S. congressman. And he becomes the first speaker of the house. He's the first, you know, John Boehner. And at that first Congress, they passed the First Amendment. And there's one signature on the First Amendment, the Bill of Rights. It's Frederick Mullenberg's signature. And so here we have these two pastors in the first Congress passing the First Amendment. Do you honestly think they would pass an amendment outlawing themselves? No. The First Amendment was to tie the federal government's hands so they would not establish one Christian denomination as the national one, which is what every country in Europe had. Anyway, so Henry Mullenberg, the dad, writes in the notebook of a colonial clergyman, I heard a fine example today, namely that His Excellency General Washington rode amongst his army yesterday and admonished each to fear God, put away wickedness, and to practice Christian virtues. Well, another miracle. There was a spy that, um, named John Andre, and he was trying to find somebody to betray America. Well, there was a guy named Benedict Arnold. He was actually a hero of the Battle of Saratoga when we captured those 6,000, and he led a flanking charge that was effective, but he did it by disobeying an order. So they did a court martial. He came out okay, but his wife felt like the Americans did not appreciate him. So she's at home nagging and nagging. Finally, she gets him to meet with this British spy, John Andre, and he agrees to betray West Point for the equivalent of a million dollars. And so he meets with the spy, and now West Point was on the Hudson River, which cuts New York in half, goes north and south, and it cuts America in half, with New England on one side and the middle southern colonies on the other. And so if you can control West Point, you can control the, the country. Now, this is it today. And so the British spy, John Andre, leaves Benedict Arnold's office, dressed as a civilian, and the Americans catch him. And they search him once, twice. They search him a third time, and hidden in the heel of his boot is the map of West Point. And so what do they do? They arrest him, and they're, they're marching him back into Benedict Arnold's office. <laughs> and Benedict Ar Arnold is like, uh, wait right here. And he flees on a ship called the Vulture and joins the British and actually fights and kills Americans. Washington uh, was willing to do a prisoner exchange. You give us Benedict Arnold back, we'll give you this John Andre spy. Well, they don't, and so we hang John Andre the spy. And George Washington writes, Treason of the blackest eye was yesterday discovered. General Arnold, who commanded at West Point, was about to give the American cause a deadly wound, if not fatal stab. Happily, the treason had been timely discovered to prevent the fatal misfortune. This providential train of circumstances, which led to its discovery, affords the most convincing proof that the liberties of America are the object of divine protection. And so the Continental Con and so Ezra Stiles, president of Yale, writes, a providential miracle at the last minute detected the treacherous schemes of traitor Benedict Arnold, which would have delivered the American army, including George Washington himself, into the hands of the enemy. And then the Continental Congress has another day of thanksgiving, saying, the late remarkable interposition of his watchful providence in the rescuing the person of our commander-in-chief and army from imminent danger at the moment when treason was ripened for execution. It is therefore recommended a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to confess our unworthiness and to offer fervent supplications to the God of all grace to cause the knowledge of Christianity to spread over all the earth. I mean, think of this. Here they are having a day of thanksgiving that Washington wasn't captured and our army wasn't betrayed, and they put at the end of it, and to cause the knowledge of Christianity to spread over all the earth. Uh, I don't think they were deists and atheists. These were Christian men and women. And then there's the Battle of Cowpens. Amen. Have you seen the movie The Patriot with Mel Gibson? And there's that famous last battle scene. Well, that was the Battle of Cowpens. You put some cows in a pen, you call the place cow pens. And so the, um, it's in South Carolina, the American general, Daniel Morgan. This is the strategic turning point of the Revolutionary War. The Americans had militia, which were known for fighting and running away. And so Daniel Morgan begs them for two shots before they run away. Behind them is a hill and with some continental 
soldiers that are battle-hardened and courageous, and they're like a brick wall. They won't budge. And then behind them is a river. Now, if you ever fight a battle, you don't want to fight it with a river behind you. Because if you're losing, it makes it hard to run away. And so it looked really foolish. And along comes the British Colonel Tarleton, known as the Butcher, because he would kill people who surrendered at the Battle of Waxhatch. Uh, there was a whole bunch of Americans that surrendered, and his men went in and sabers and just sliced them and killed them after they surrendered. And so in the movie of that Mel Gibson, they have Colonel Tarleton, known as the Butcher, and so he's riding along with his dragoons. These are these guys on these big horses with their big saber swords. They're the fastest thing on the battlefield. You cannot outrun a galloping horse. And so they see the American militias, and they know that they would just fight and run away, and they see the river behind them, and they go, what fools, and they charge. And they're at a full gallop, charge, charge, charge. The Americans fire once, boom. The British keep charging. The Americans fire twice, boom. And then the, the American militia runs away over the hill and goes around the side, and then the British come and charge, and they come over the hill, and there are these Continental soldiers that don't budge, and they fire, boom. They kill 100 of the British just like that. And then the ones that ran away come around the other side and attack the British from the side. And they're like, oh, and 800 of the British throw down their arms and surrender. It's the Battle of Cowpens. And this is the strategic turning point of the war. Now, these dragoons were the cream of the crop of the British Army. They were like the, the toughest fighters, and they, they now are captured. And so the American general, Daniel Morgan, is hightailing it out of South Carolina, across North Carolina, and he's on his way to Virginia. And as the British are chasing the Americans, uh, it's Cornwallis. The, the head guy, British Cornwallis, is chasing the Americans. And they come to the Catawba River. And as they're crossing it, the Americans get across, the British show up shortly thereafter, but before they can start crossing, there is a flash flood, and the British have to wait a day to cross. The British cross, and now they're headed toward the Yadkin River in North Carolina, and the British are leaving behind their heavy wagons and all their supplies, and they're just trashing it all, and they're going as fast as they can, and they get to the Yadkin River, and the Americans j had just crossed, but before the British can cross, another flash flood. They have to put off the pursuit. And then they cross, and they're chasing the Americans, and he's, Cornwallis is leaving all of his supplies behind. He is just after the Americans. And at 1 o'clock in the morning, they get to the Dan River. They're watching the Americans get out the other side. But before the British can start crossing, another flash flood. They have to put off the pursuit. And this is the tremendous victory. The British commander, Henry Clinton, writes, Here the royal army was again stopped by a sudden rise of the waters, which had only just fallen almost miraculously to let the enemy over, who could not else have eluded Lord Cornwallis's grasp, so close was he upon their rear. And so now Cornwallis has an army with no supplies, because he had trashed them along the way. And so he's ordered to wait at Yorktown for some British ships and that is finally when the um, French show up with the French fleet. They block the British ships, and Cornwallis is forced to surrender on October 19, 1781. And so, it's a great victory. Washington tells his men to diffuse the general joy through every breast. The general orders divine service to be performed tomorrow in the several brigades. The commander-in-chief earnestly recommends troops not on duty should universally attend with that gratitude of heart which the recognition of such astonishing interposition of providence demands. And John Jay was the first chief justice of the Supreme Court. He writes, this glorious revolution is distinguished by so many marks of the divine favor and interposition that no doubt can remain of it being supported in a manner so singular, and I may say miraculous, that when future ages shall read its history, they will be tempted to consider a great part of it as fabulous, as made up. And Ralph Waldo Emerson said, America appears like a last effort of divine providence in behalf of the human race. And Washington writes, it will not be believed that such a force as Great Britain has employed for eight years in this country could be baffled in their plan of subjugating it by numbers infinitely less composed of men oftentimes half-starved, always in rags, without pay, and experiencing at times every species of distress which human nature is capable of undergoing. The singular interpositions of providence, Washington says, 
in our feeble condition were such as could scarcely escape the attention of the most unobserving. While the perseverance of the armies of the United States, through almost every possible suffering and discouragement for a space of eight long years, was little short of a standing miracle. Uh, at the Constitutional Convention, Ben Franklin writes, in the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayer in this room for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard and graciously answered. All of us who were engaged in, in the contest must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. And so Sam Adams writes, there are instances of an almost astonishing providence in our favor. Our success has staggered our enemies and almost given faith to infidels so that we may truly say it is not our own arm which has saved us. The hand of heaven appears to have led us on to perhaps humble, to be humble instruments and means in the great providential dispensation which is completing. So the Treaty of Paris ends the Revolutionary War. Did you know the Treaty of Paris starts off in the name of the most holy and undivided trinity? <laughs> this is the treaty that gives birth to America. Having pleased divine providence to dispose the hearts of the most serene, most potent King George III, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, to forget all past misunderstandings, blah, 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 done in the year of the Lord. Um, now, the uh, President Ronald Reagan said this. In 1775, the Continental Congress proclaimed the first National Day of Prayer. In 1783, the Treaty of Paris officially ended the long, weary Revolutionary War, during which a National Day of Prayer had been proclaimed every spring for eight years. And I love this. In 1854, there was a Congressman, James Meacham, and he was giving a report to the U.S. Congress. And he writes, down to the revolution, every colony did sustain religion in some form. It was deemed peculiarly proper that the religion of liberty should be upheld by a free people. Had the people during the revolution had a suspicion of any attempt to war against Christianity, that revolution would have been strangled in its cradle. In other words, if you were to tell these people someday in the future they're going to want to outlaw Christianity, they would have stopped the revolution. Well, the story is that our country was birthed by us standing up against great odds. The most powerful military power, the British Empire, the most powerful king that planet Earth had ever seen, and we had no army and no navy, just a bunch of courageous people that were Christian and had faith and courage. Here we are today facing problems, and the good Lord is looking down upon us, and he loves to use little people who are small in their own eyes, but big in faith and courage to do great things. This is your opportunity. Don't be discouraged by what's out there in the world. The good Lord, out of these 6,000 years, chose for you to be alive right now, Amen. right? Like uh, Pastor Gary is a, a coaches, and so is Pastor Chuck. And um, we had breakfast together. And so God is like the coach. And you're the player that he drafted. And he's got you on the bench. And he's slapping you on the back. It says, get in the game. This is, this is, I want you to be born. I want you to get on earth. I want you to do great things. And you're like, oh, but they're playing so tough out there. It's like, no, I made you. You've got what it takes. You've got my word hidden in your heart. You've got a tremendous church, a tremendous pastor. You've got the Holy Spirit. You've got everything. Go for it. God has plans to use you greatly in the days ahead. Well, God bless you. I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Gary. Thank you so much.